Ah, uh, yes, hi everyone. I hope you all are doing well. I'm Jermaine Farrell, the WFXR Sports Director, with something cool for you right now, for you great sports fans on WFXRTV.com. It is called the WFXR Sports Sit Down. Each Tuesday and Friday on WFXRTV.com, I will sit down and interview a local, regional, and national person in the world of sports. It is our commitment to bring you some of the best interviews we can have for you right here on WFXRTV.com. Thank you for logging on to the WFXR Sports Sit Down on WFXRTV.com. Enjoy. All right, folks, Jermaine Farrell in the house with the WFXR Sports Sit Down. I tell you, it's always fun catching up with you know, great people in the world of sports, and, and this young man is no exception. You know, I tell you, you, you talk about a guy that ran track in the right way. I mean, a state champion here at Patrick Green High School running track, uh, parlayed that to a great career at Arkansas State in football and track, then a uh, Canadian Football League in, in the education field and coaching field down in Georgia since 2007, and currently he's a track coach at Lamar County Schools. Hope I got, and with, there's so much in the resume, they won't give it all away, but we're going to wait on that. But anyway, one of the great ones, James Hickenbotham, a uh, proud Patrick Henry Patriot and, and Red Wolf and everything else. And thanks for being on the WFSR Sports Sit Down on WFSRTV.com. Man, listen, it's a pleasure to be here, man. I really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity. Well, I'll tell you one thing, and recently, we're going to get into this, you won from the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame the Humanitarian, or was it Good Samaritan Award? Is that? Good, yeah, Good Samaritan Award. Well, cool. um, That's what, yeah, talk that, about that. You know, well, that, that award, I didn't even know it existed. Uh, I got a phone call um, one day, and I was just talking to the guy, and he said, well, listen, man, we have an award for you, and we're going to have it at the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame, and we really would love for you to come and, and be honored. And when he told me what it was, I said, wow, people must be watching me and paying attention because, you know, you work so hard and uh, I don't do anything for accolades. Um, I had my time period for accolades. Now I'm trying to help other people advance themselves in their career. And so when someone takes the time to give you an honor like that, to me, I think it's just more so saying thank you. Thank you for the work that you do with our kids and thank you for the time that you sacrifice. So I'm just very uh, fortunate to have won that award and I'm um, just going to keep working even harder. It's motivation. You know, first of all, I just want to ask you this. Uh, where did your love for sports come from? Uh, well, I mean, I've always been an athletic kid, even from a young age. But uh, my sports model, if you want to put it that way, um, was my father. Uh, growing up, I would uh, read the old newspaper clippings. My father was a, uh, a football, I'd say, legend back in Clifton Forge, which is up there close to the Covington area. A lot of people know David Hickenbotham. Um, he had some, uh, some battles with Addison back in the day when I believe Addison was a high school when uh, Coach Al Holland and a few people played on that team. So they know each other very well. But I would read those articles on Saturday mornings. And I'm like, wow, my dad was a great football player. And I was like, man, I want to do this one day. Then I would look at some other articles, see my mom was a gymnast and she was a track athlete. And she did well at Clifton Ford. I said, man, you know, I want to try this stuff myself. But here's the funny part about it. So uh, I've, I've, I've done a lot of sports. I've done football, baseball, basketball, track. Uh, I'm a third degree black belt in, in uh, Okinawan Kenpo Karate. Um, Steve Mason talked about that years ago on uh, Channel 7 back when I was in high school. But here's the funny thing about sports. Uh, I would come home. I was a big time wrestling fan. So I would always, you know, put pillows out on the floor and I'd be jumping off the couch and doing a macho man elbow to Jimmy Superfly snooker splash. And then my dad came home one day, literally caught me mid act. I mean, I'm on the top of the sofa about to do a splash. He's like, hey, man, what are you doing? I was just like, I really, I, I'm caught. He's like, you know what? Um, you got too much energy. We're going to start putting you in sports. Like you signed up for something tomorrow. And whatever season it is, that's what sport you're playing. You're not coming home no more. Turn up my stuff. <laughs> and so that's really how my, my, my sports career started. And, uh, but I fell in love the moment uh, I got out there and got active. So your, your parents, you said your parents uh, both went, went to Addison? My father went to Clifton Forge. Clifton Forge, okay. You said yeah, Addison. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's when they, uh, well, they had a rivalry with Addison back in the day. 
Oh, okay, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Clifton Forge High School. So my mom went to Clifton Forge and uh, my dad went to Clifton Forge. And my mom even spent some time in Covington as well. So my family's kind of from out in the country area. Then you come to Roanoke City, which some would maybe call the big city and some may not, you know, but coming from Clifton Forge, you know, that area up there, that's a pretty big step up. So I'm, I kind of got the city life compared to the country life that they were accustomed to. Good deal. And then, you know, obviously your, your love uh, blossomed to, you know, go over to Patrick Henry and you had a storied career at Patrick Henry and, you know, with football and track. And we'll get into track in a second because we could spend a lot of time on that. But from the football thing, I think a lot of people remember just your, just the yards you piled up and your big battles <laughs> over against another guy wearing the blue and gold and Lee Suggs. And I know you two are real close, but talk <clears throat> about just those battles you guys had because they were epic. I mean, you talk about tearing up the, you know, things over here at Victory Stadium. I mean, you guys had a battle. Well, I'll tell you what, man, Lee Suggs, he's a good friend of mine and uh, we respect each other very well. But even to this day, I mean, it's always still going to be a little bit of that competitive edge. And I promise you, uh, even when he was in the NFL and I saw him break down the sideline for a touchdown, I'm doing push-ups when I'm watching. I'm like, wait a minute. He's trying to get an edge on me. Let me go ahead and make sure I stay on top of my game. You know, but um, this was in my man cave. I don't even know if you can even see it clearly, but um, this yeah. is actually, I'm going to tilt it so you can kind of see a little bit. There you go. But this is an action shot of me and Lee Suggs running. Uh, I believe it's an EC glass at a track meet. Yeah. And I, I like this picture because it shows both of, us, both of us straining, like with as much grit as possible to try to keep the other person from beating us. And um, it's been that way for the longest time. We started uh, in, I want to say, Little League back when he played for Williamson Road. And I played for Wilmot and Northwest. And we just had battles. I mean, if I break for a touchdown and he run down the sideline and tackle me, or if he broke for a touchdown, I run down the sideline and tackle him. So this started way back when we were talking about probably 11, 12, or 13 years old. Um, and so then we get into our high school careers. And um, actually, what people didn't, what people don't know is I actually was at Fleming. Yeah, I was I was at Fleming for a uh, amount of time in the summertime. Um, I think. Shirley Stewart, Coach Stewart may have been the coach there. Coach Miller was still active with the program. And then I got a letter from the Ronald City School Board stating that I needed to go to another school because they rezoned the lines. But just think there for a moment, James Hickenbotham and Lee Suggs were on the same football team. So that championship game may turn out a little different down there against Ronald Curry and the Hampton Crabbers if both of us team up. I think the nod goes to Ronald City Schools at that time period. Um, but yeah, just a, an amazing rivalry. And we talk about it to this day that um, we propelled each other's career. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm going to forever be a part of Lee Suggs' story and Lee Suggs is going to forever be a part of my story. And it's because of our competitions and battles against each other is what truly launched us into greatness. That had to be real fun. Now, and also, could you email me a copy of that picture? I can. I'm trying to save it for a special occasion, but I'll I send it to you. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, we want to use it for the story because that's a good Absolutely. One. That's a good picture right there. Yeah. So, and then, you know, obviously on the, 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 the track side of things, I mean, Patrick track really, it's kind of grew in stages. I mean, it was, it was, it got strong. We, we were there and then obviously Jamie doing his thing and then you kind of took it to another level. You know, what, what was it like being a part of a, a track program that really was just just taking off, taking off, and then finally, you know, you're there, and it really was right. I, quite honest, I think you, you like taking a baton in a relay. You really took it to another level and helped really have a Pat Henry have the success under the guidance, obviously, Coach Johnson and then Coach Jones. And I'll ask you a couple of questions about them in a second. But what was it like, really, to see that the program just even go further with you? Mm -hmm. Well, I knew about the Patrick Henry track and field program back when I was in middle school. Um, the Cosmopolitan had been around for a long time, and I know I would go to those track meets, and that's the first time I saw Jamie Price. You know, first when I looked at him, you know, just to be honest, me short guy, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm not really – that couldn't be the Jamie Price they're talking about because his name made him look like he was probably six foot four, you know, like this, this, this you know, mastodon running on the track. But – when he got on that track and I saw him take off and run, I said, you've got to be kidding me. I can't believe somebody can run that fast. And to be in middle school and, and for him to come over and shake my hand and talk to me and then 
uh, find out years later we're going to be teammates. And he ended up being a, a big brother and a mentor of mine. And I would just say the leadership in general at Patrick Henry from the athletes um, really um, covered me and ca it caused me to grow and develop in the way that I should. Uh, wasn't always easy days for the rookie when I got there. Because, uh, you know, you got to pay your dues. You know, you can't just come in and, and say this and that. You got to prove that you're this and that. And, um, and they require that of me. But to be a part of a program with Coach Jeff Johnson, uh, Tommy Jones, um, obviously James Earl Jones, and it was another, uh, if I start, uh, Coach, Tar Coach Tarpley. Coach Tarpley. Tarpley. At Tarpley, Tarpley. Yeah. yeah. Adam Tarpley. Yeah. Yes. I mean, these men cared about track and field. And it wasn't so like, you know, I'm, I've been in other areas where track coaches are just, it's put on your title, but you're really there for another purpose. And sometimes they'll just throw track and field on somebody, you know, like you're really here for football or wherever it is, but we'll throw the track and field supplement on you, you know, just to kind of fill the spot. But these men truly cared about track and field. They really cared about developing you not only as an athlete, but as a person. And uh, Coach Johnson and all his different sayings, man, and Coach Jones, all them together, it was just unreal. You know, you, you run a, a bunch of 200s and everybody's falling out. And he, he called it, well, we got the fetal relays. Everybody's in the fetal position. You know, it's just eagle funny. And, eagle and die. Eagle and die. Eagle and die. Eagle and die. <laughs> <laughs> Hard workouts. But it definitely built me um, for the long haul. I just want to say, you know, remember you re – and, and, you, and, you know, we, I got one of them from him you recreate those shirts that we had because back then when i was running we had those shirts and you recreated them and, and thank you for hooking that up because those sayings and everybody was wondering where it's it's kind of like the pillars of the track program well those were our yeah. sayings you know and, and yeah. we, we created them back then in the early 90s late 80s early 90s everybody's like what are these shirts because we wore them and they were like our mantra i mean those are things we're not going to do and we're going to do but it was exactly classic. And the thing is, you know, Coach Johnson, Coach, both Coach Jones, Coach Tarpley, all of them impacted me as well. But that was when, like I said, we were growing the program. And then all of a sudden now, you know, we got Jamie in there. And then we, we took it to another level with you. And like I said, it's, it's awesome to see what, what you guys did with it. And so from your perspective, and you're right about one thing. It wasn't just, okay, by the way, we're track coaches. They really had a game plan and a role they had to do. Now, what do you feel was, you know, do you have any funny stories from, you know, Coach Johnson, both Coach Jones and Coach Tarpley? you have any stories that stood out that, you know, you, you, when you think of them, you just laugh at and you think it's hilarious? I have stories. I have to find ways to make sure it's PG-13 for the news station. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, um, there are definitely stories. I mean, and they're rolling through my head now. I'm just trying to find like a good version of it that's appropriate. But right. to see their passion, I mean, I've seen uh, a coach. I'm not gonna say which coach it is. Put it that way. Okay. But I, I did, I did see a coach one time uh, because he went over a technique with someone about ten times right. on like how to do a first step, and the person could not figure it out. And I literally saw this person pick up a pole vault pole and launch it all the way across the field, like a world record distance for like a javelin. And we're just all looking at this guy like, oh my God, how powerful could this guy possibly be? Uh, but anyway, there's another story that uh, <laughs> I'm probably, I'm gonna tell it. We, uh, we were all going to uh, VMI on a track meet. And uh, you know, Coach Jones, he, he didn't really walk around and he would have jeans on, but he always have like his little boots and everything. We would kind of crack on his boots every now and then. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a wintry day. I mean, it's snowed, it's icy and everything. And uh, me and Lewis Booker and uh, Sean Akers, Chad Giles, Raheem, a bunch of us in the vehicle. And so anyway, we pull over to a, I think a McDonald's. And, mm -hmm. uh, and this is not necessarily track related, but it's just related because it's just funny stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we get out of the van and the first person slips. It's like, oh, hey, guys, watch out. There's some ice on the running board. You know, and the next person's like, I don't care about that. And then they step down and they slip. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Listen, there's really some ice on the running board. Mm -hmm. So we tell Coach Jones and he's like, ah, man, ain't no ice on my running board. And he touched that running board and he went airborne. <laughs> and got stuck in between two vehicles like this. He's like, oh, man. I'm like, oh, come on, coach, man. We tried to tell you, but we were laughing. 
uh, nonstop for about 30 minutes in uh, McDonald's. We just couldn't stop. Now, I did have something personal happen to me at the track one time. Um, you know, I'm a rookie. I'm ninth grader. You know, I got all these upper class. Me, you know, we got some pretty girls in the track meet. So I'm, I'm on the track team. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to impress people, right? So anyhow, um, I look in the shed over there where the pole vault mats and stuff was, and I saw a parachute. I was like, oh, man, I'm impressed, everybody. I'm going to go and put this parachute on. I'm going to make it fly really high in the air, and everybody's going to look at me. And, you know, I'm going to get some attention. This ninth graders, you know, I'm coming on the scene to try to make something happen. So I look over at a crowd of girls over in a little section, and some of the seniors, they're looking at me kind of like, man, what's this dude doing? And so I put the parachute on, and I take off. You know, and I'm rolling now. I'm flying, and I go around the curve, and one of my feet, my foot, feet, foot, how you want to say it, my leg went back and got tangled up in the parachute. And I literally went inside the parachute, and me and the parachute rolled down the track, mm -hmm. just like a cannonball, all the way off onto the field. When I got up, practice was over with. Everybody was on the ground laughing at this <laughs> foolish rookie who came out here, thought he was going to impress somebody, and I ended up being a laughing stock. So, uh, you know, I got plenty of stories, plenty of stories. Take me back to your state championship. I mean, because you, you, it was up at, I want to say it was your indoor meet, and I think it was at the 55? It was. The 55, okay. <clears throat> and and just, just take me back to that time, because, I mean, back then, people don't realize, and this was when you had three classifications. I mean, track and field at the triple A level. Mm. Typically, you're going, and, and the meet was at George Mason, so you're going up against all those, you're, basically, it was a home meet for Northern Virginia. Right. You're going up against these studs, and they're looking at, here's this kid from Roanoke, Virginia, knocking us off. I mean, what's up with that? So just take me back to that moment, because I'm sure it was special. It was very special, but I'm going to precede that moment and talk about what built up to it. Um, I, I have to, and this is probably a good time to go ahead and start talking about Coach Jones. Uh, he has taught me so much um, as it relates to coaching track and field and, and being a track and field athlete. So there was this guy, nationally acclaimed, his name was Mike Newell. Uh, had never lost. I mean, he went like two, two, three years undefeated, did not lose state champion, national championship, go overseas. He didn't lose to nobody. Uh, he was also a 25-foot long jump, believe it or not, just amazing. Uh, raw, uh, you know, raw ability. And so that we was in the same region because he went to Potomac High School. And I knew that when Potomac showed up, the best I could do was second place because he was just phenomenal. And, but up until that point, I had made some excuses as far as my training. Like Coach Jones would put a workout out there and I, I would work through it, but I, I knew inside myself, I wasn't working as hard as I could. I was just trying to survive the day. And so we get to my senior year and after everything happened with football, which is great, me and him talked and I said, Coach, I'm no longer gonna make any excuses. Whatever work you have for me, I'm gonna do it because I gotta beat this guy this year. He said, okay. He said, all right. And so <clears throat> we went to work. And we actually started going to track meets, watching this guy run. I remember uh, Coach Jones had a camera, one of them old VCR type cameras, camcorders, <laughs> you know, because he always commentate on it. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, we videoed Mike Newell, and then we went back to the school, and he literally started teaching me the dynamics of a sprinter, the drive phases, what parts of my, uh, my running style uh, were better than his and what he was doing in his running that was better than mine. And so we started to, we put a plan together. So by this track meet, I need to do this. And by the next track meet, I need to have done this. And so what I noticed was the person that was, I mean, he was so, he, you know, probably five or six strides ahead of me. He was that fast. And then it would go from six strides to four strides, four strides to two strides, two strides till we get to the region championship. And I walk up on him at the end, everybody kind of looked at me like, hold on, wait a minute, what, what just happened? Did you just get close to Mike Newell? And so we went back to the drawing board again. It was like, all right, well, now we got to go into the next phase. If you're going to beat him at the state championship, you have to be consistent. Because track and field is not about, you know, that one-time spurt. You have to have a performance and you got to be consistent. That's why there's trials, there's semis, and there's finals. You break a world record in trials, that's great. But if you don't win a championship, nobody's going to talk about that. So when we get to the state championship and I'm feeling good, I mean, I'm in tip top shape and uh, Coach Jones said, man, this might be the day. And I said, well, if he's going to beat me today, he's going to have to, you know, use everything in the tank because I'm emptying everything I got. And um, <clears throat> there was a picture, I think Getty Images that took a picture of the state championship, me going across the finish line. 
when I took off and ran and I got to that close to that finish line, I didn't even, I didn't even see him. I could not believe what just happened. I threw my arms up. I literally strided the last two steps in and almost let him catch back up and win the race. But I was so far, like, I can't believe I'm beating this guy. So here's the rest of the story. And Coach Jeff Johnson can att attest to this. So I throw my hands up in victory because this guy's beat me like 20 some straight times. Like, I just no chance of me beating him. So I beat him for my last race indoor of the state championship. I run around the track at George Mason. You're supposed to return back to your lane. In celebration, I'm running around the track, the atmosphere. You have three to 4,000 people that are there to watch this guy run. He's the top runner in America. And it goes from cheers to like complete silence because everybody's like, what just happened? And the only people yelling in the entire stadium were Patrick Henry people. And me and my best friend, Chad Giles, we met down by the long jump. We jumped up to the chest bump. And uh, Coach Jeff Johnson, he wanted to celebrate, but he was fussing at me like, man, you about to get disqualified. Go back to your lane so they can get the information down. So then he had to go and talk to them and, and try to appease them so they wouldn't take the championship from me. But I was just overwhelmed with joy. But it taught me that day that if you put a plan together, anything's possible if you work towards and you have faith. That's awesome stuff. Talk about the recruiting process. Because obviously you, you're strong in football, strong in track. Just, just take me through the recruiting process to get to the next level to go to school. All right. So, I mean, as far as me now as a coach or just for an athlete in general? No, no. I'm just talking about like when you were recruited to go to, go to college. Okay. Um, the recruiting process was pretty interesting. Um, I was noticing for some reason I wasn't getting the letters that I thought I should in high school. Uh, but there was a switch in – and coaches and I guess some letters kind of were not uh, available to me at the time um, but I did get those a little later but once I did get those letters I noticed that there was a, a, a wide range of people that were very interested in me uh, but the issue that I had is my first couple of years of high school I didn't focus on my grades like I should have you know versus my counterpart across town um, was always a, a upstanding student um, so the last two years, I had to really buckle down to get my GPA where it needed to be in order for me to uh, be able to get a scholarship to college for uh, football or track and field. And so I opted to go to Fork Union Military Academy, and that gave me a chance to redo aspects of my senior year and allow me to take the test uh, two or three more times to get the correct score. And so when I got the score, um, there was schools that were very interested in me. I was still getting letters from colleges for track and field, but my heart at that time was still football. I just still had so much to offer in the sport of football. And so I get a phone call from Joe Hollis, who was the head coach at Arkansas State at the time. He was, he knew Fork Union because he went to Fork Union to get Eddie George. Hmm. So um, they had a good rapport there. So when he called and, and told me who he was, uh, I was like, Arkansas State, uh, that's, that's a little far. I don't know if I'm going to do that. So here's how the story gets interesting. <laughs> so they, uh, they come up and see me, and uh, then they fly me down to Arkansas State. They pick me up from the airport. I go out to eat. Uh, I go out to eat, and there's a guy sitting at the table. Is a black guy. He's from Virginia. He's from Dinwiddie, Virginia. His name is Mike Tomlin. <laughs> and so... I'm talking to Mike Tomlin, and uh, I'm like, you know, Coach, this is a long ways away. Now, anybody that's ever heard him talk know he has the gift of gab, even then, you know, a younger version of himself. And so he says, he said, hey, come on, man. I'm from right down the road from you, man. I'm from Dinwiddie, Virginia, but look where I am. He said, don't let distance determine your destiny. And I said, wow. And you know, man, I'm, I'm 18, 19 years old listening to this man with the gift of gab. And I'm like, wow, you know what? If I can be coached by you, I, I would make this thing happen. <laughs> you know, but he was on the move. So as soon as I get to Arkansas State, then that's when he started advancing his career as well. Um, but when I got there, I was able to play football and had a, a really good freshman season. And I was still running some track, but I wasn't able to focus on track as much because, you know, football was paying the bills. So, so – Mike Tomlin was an assistant at Arkansas State, and he recruited you. He was one of the ones recruiting me, yes. <laughs> to this day, I, to this day, he, he owes me a job because he left me. He did. <laughs> he did. So I guess the big lesson is, and when, when you look at it, you know, you, you talk about grades, 
I mean, I'm sure you stress yeah. it as an educator, and now we'll yeah. talk about it in a second, but it, it stresses the importance of that because, like you mentioned, you look at, you know, Lee Suggs. He went to Virginia Tech. You, if your grades were right, you probably could have went to, a, a, you know, a, a yeah. Power 5 school. I mean, so do, you, do you use that as a, as a lesson to let everybody know, your students and your, your athletes know, hey, you got to have your grades right if you want to get to a certain level at a school? Absolutely. I mean, that's a motivating factor. And um, I believe there's a book that we all read on Sundays that say that they are delivered by the words of their testimony. And so I believe the testimony of my life and the things that I've went through can help somebody, you know, get themselves to the next level. The goal for all of us should be that the next generation be better than us. We're not competing with the next generation. We're going to give them all the tools they need to where they can take, take that baton, all right, and advance the leg even further. It's, uh, and, and you know what's what's interesting? Uh, there's a there's a phrase that I use. My pastor gave me. He said, "God gives you a test so you can have a testimony." And that's, I agree. With that. That's what what I use now. Um, I would tell you a funny story. I think I've told you this before. And this was I think I told you this at the um, at Coach Jones' funeral. Mm-hmm. And so I you know I'm in Oklahoma. And I'm I'm watching a, a Oklahoma game. It was it was Oklahoma and Arkansas State. This was two, I think y'all played Oklahoma in 2001. That's correct. I think that's yeah. The year they won the national championship. That's right. So hearing this name, and, and I knew about you already, and I but I couldn't remember. Well, where did he go to school? All right. So then I'm hearing back to return the kick for Arkansas State, James. James Hickenbotham, whoa, James Hickenbotham. So I, I grabbed the program, <laughs> but I'm like, what? <laughs> not to <hear> into him. <laughs> All right. And you had a decent game there. I mean, and I'm like, this is pretty cool, James Hickenbotham. I mean, yeah. So out of all a small world, you know, because I'm, I'm living in uh, Lawton, Oklahoma. You know, okay. And I'm coming up, you know, every now and then, you know, we get, we get some Oklahoma game. And there's James Hickenbotham. I'm like, that's pretty cool. That's, that's awesome. Imagine that. Oh, that's, that small world, even though, I mean, there was like 80,000 people there, so I don't think I could have got oh, there. Packed. Too. Packed but, uh, but, yeah, it was pretty neat right there. All right, so then after, after you graduate, and you, get, you, you go, um, you get an opportunity to play some pro football, but north of the border. Talk about just that experience. Uh, it, was a, it was a good experience. I mean, prior to that, um, there were some workings where um, I was supposed to go to the Redskins, which would have been great, um, <laughs> but – I was going to be a return specialist, but they had uh, they were awarded uh, a guy named Chad Morton. They was awarded Chad Morton in the arbitration hearing, so they no, no longer needed a return specialist. So I was, like, kind of looking on the outside end for that one. And the Green Bay Packers, that was supposed to happen around the sixth or seventh round. But, you know, they have different reasons why they choose one person over another, right? And so I ended up uh, doing a workout for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And so I went to Canada, and uh, that, was a, that was a good experience. What people don't know about Canada is they have an, um, an American maximum that they can have on the team. Because <clears throat> I guess if the whole team is full of Americans, it's American football, not Canadian football. <laughs> so um, the, the difficult task for anyone going over to Canada to play football is that at that time, they could only have 17 Americans on the team. So when you get there, there are already 17 Americans on the team. So you have to actually beat somebody out of their position. And so uh, it was, that was a difficult task, you know, especially when every time they help you, am I going to help someone that's about to take my job? So it's, a, it's an interesting perspective when you looked at, look at it. But uh, I enjoyed my time there. I, I did two preseasons. I did one with the Calgary St. Peters and then also with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, as I just mentioned. So I did that for a little bit. And then I left there and went to Georgia to kind of gain my bearings. And my agent told me about the Make It Knights, which was an arena football team. And the big thing there was that I need to just keep playing football. Uh, Because you can't – football, the football industry is not about what you've done. It's what have you done lately. Nobody cares about what you did two and three years ago. Are you still active? Are you still putting up these type of numbers now? Yes, then we'll bring you back to camp. So that's when I came to Macon. That's what brought me to Georgia. I never heard of Macon, Georgia, a day in my life. I know it's the home of Otis Redding and Little Richard. There's a lot of history here, but I didn't know much about uh, uh, Macon, Georgia. So I played for a few seasons and did really well and had a few opportunities to uh, 
have some workouts set up for the Falcons. But once again, you know, things got to really work in the right way for those things to work out for you. So from there, I had decided that uh, I was going to go into education. And uh, I mean, I, I was still athletic. I could still play the game. Everything was still good. But <clears throat> for some people, sports may be the only thing they feel like they have to offer. But me, I don't. You know, my God gave me a brain. He gave me hands. He gave me uh, two hands, two feet. He gave me ability, I mean, uh, opportunity and ability to, uh, you know, make impacts on people's lives. And so that's what I jumped into right after that. So talk a little bit about that, because the thing is, you have shaped the minds of young people and, and helped in, in that regard in being a track coach, an educator. What's that like, you know, to help and, and, and shape the minds of today's youth? Well, um, you have to look at it from the standpoint that, you know, one day we're going to get older. Right. So there's so what type of world are we leaving for them? And more so, what type of world are they going to have when they get to that time period? So just being in the classroom and and I, I've done middle school, I've done high school. And at those younger ages, you you will really be surprised how much they know as far as what's going on in the world. You would think some things might be over their head, even in the elementary realm. These kids know about a lot of politics and things that are going on in the world. So just to have the opportunity to hear things from their viewpoint and to impart and plant some knowledge and information in their mind to brighten up their future, there's nothing that uh, delights me more. And then to know that through Coach Jones teaching a lot of other coaches that I've been under, I have now the ability to use sport like track and field or football, and I can give them something that gives them an opportunity to go to school for free. So you're talking about four years of college education at a major school or not even a major school. It could be a, um, a smaller school. That's still, you know, whatever the tuition fees and rooms and books and board and all of that for four years, that's a decent amount of money. Anybody that's had to take out a student loan will tell you that's a decent amount of money. So the fact that they have an opportunity, if they work towards it, that they can get that paid for free, man, that's, that's like uh, someone starting life, but um, they're shooting out of the blocks instead of standing there at the line. Thank you so much for checking out the latest edition of the WFXR Sports Sit Down on WFXRTV.com. For all the latest news, sports, and weather, there is only one place for you to go. That is WFXRTV.com. Also, we have another cool option for you. It is called the WFXR News app. Please download it because guess what? It is a free app. You can't beat that. Again, thank you so much for logging on to WFXRTV.com for the WFXR Sports Sit Down. I'm Jermaine Farrell. Hope all of your teams are winners. Have a wonderful and blessed day, everyone.